I don't think you've um, fully established Rizzo yet. I think it's Pete Rizzo. No, yeah, I, I need to get more dominant on Rizzo. Yeah. yeah. Do you that's, know what you should do? Mm. You need to get the handle at Rizzo. Okay, that's cool. It's yeah, like Matt Odell. It's like sense. at Odell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that's fair. I'm gonna write that down because that's actually good advice. <laughs> I, <laughs> I never, I never uh, think of you as Pete. I think or Rizzo. I think of you as Pete. Well, Rizzo. I think it was we did the Satoshi show, and then you called me Rizzo the whole time, and I was like, "All right, I'm just gonna re I'm just gonna go that way." Well, I, that was you know. I was sending you a signal. You were back you were the fuck like, off. You were like, "I now own the real estate." Yeah, I am Pete. <laughs> I am Bitcoin Pete. Just wait till Dennis uh, Barker is gonna he's gonna come in there and it's gonna who? <laughs> Who's that guy? The podcaster. I've never heard of he's him. He's a podcaster. Never heard he's of him. The biggest podcast. He's fucking not. <laughs> Uh, I've never heard of him, but well, hey, his emails in my inbox. I mean, he's got to have a podcast somewhere. There is a few Peters. There is it's Peter Todd. Peter Todd. Yeah, Peter. but he's he's always been a two name Bitcoiner because it's always like Peter Todd, you know. But I think you're a two name Bitcoiner. Mm, I don't know. I don't like it. I want to be a one name Bitcoiner. You, you know? gotta you gotta own that Rizzo. We you should know, branding safe, campaign. Safe, you know, <laughs> or uh, Sailor, you know, Pierre. Pierre, yeah, you know, I'm trying to think held. Of Pele, <laughs> Maradona. It's like, it's like Zendaya, you know, she's like the, the Gen Z actress that everybody likes. She was in Dune. She was in okay. Dune, yeah. She's got one name, you know. Everybody else is out there with two names. She's yeah. ahead of the game, you know. Have you watched Dune yet? I, yes, I did. What yeah. did you think? Not great, solid. I think it looked good. Uh, monochromatic to the point of being like so restrictive. Everything was fucking black and gold. Yeah. My main takeaway was that at least in Lord of the Rings, like people ate and laughed and generally seemed like they gave a shit about other things, like other than what was going on. Nobody Whereas Dune was like very, like who was Oscar Isaac playing in that? He seemed to be playing Oscar Isaac. Like there was no character there. The only real actor was Javier Bardem was great. Mm -hmm. The woman who played Jessica was great. And then other than that, it was a wash. Oh, uh, is that Rebecca Ferguson? Yeah. Yeah, she's... I don't. What else has she been in? I don't. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember where she was in. Is this um, a podcast? Yeah, we're, we're we're going. Yeah, we're going to talk about boxing for twenty three minutes. In the... Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was solid. It was solid, but it wasn't. It wasn't great. I I liked it. I liked the first hour. It then it oh. kept kind of going. And, but it kind of just like the pace dropped. Yes. It was like the because the, you know they, they didn't really know what to do with it. Yeah, they were trying to set up the second one. Second exactly, one. And yeah. which has been green lit. But if, if it was one movie, mm -hmm. you would have that drop and then you would come back. But I just felt like suddenly they're having a fight and he stabs a guy. I was like, what? what the fuck? Yeah. I think like there was a period where like, so the other thing that I that made me realize is that in Lord of the Rings, like what they did really well is they scaled the action up consecutively over the movies where if you think yeah. about it, like the action in movie one is just like the hobbits being chased around by like horses and shit. I feel like- <laughs> And then the next one is the battle. There's one battle. And then the next movies are in the entirety of the thing is a battle. So they, they scale the action up with the world as they develop the world. Whereas in Dune, it was just like, they did neither of those things. The, the plot was good. The mm. world was bad. Everything was black or gold. Everybody matched. It was terrible. It's drab. It was boring. That did, that that didn't bother me. That I was like, wow, me. black and gold are really in, and everyone looks like they are also a model for Kanye West. So. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were wearing Yeezys in this whole world. They're like uh, the world of Atreides. They are. Kanye well, I, I liked it, uh, but I. The most important thing, it wasn't a disappointment. Is this like the tactic so that people can't tell when the podcast begins? No, it's just, this yeah. is my tactic to just get out of Bitcoin. Oh, okay. I just gradually yeah. bring shit in mm -hmm. and like transfer people over and and then I don't talk about Bitcoin anymore. All right. It's, it's oh, angle. so you're trying to like, yeah, to cross over. Just do something like, like, what do we want to do? Do you want to start, should we start with, so why is there 21 million? <laughs> Let's talk about inflation. No, please like not. This, God. I mean, Bitcoin has nothing to do with inflation. Can we start there? Like, let's, let's at least start there. Let me finish just on June by saying the best thing is that it wasn't a major disappointment. So many of those, the 300 or... That 300 was great. Who didn't like the 300? 300, 300, right? 300 was disappointing. Foundation is... No one expected anything from the 300. Oh, I did from the trailer. I saw Did the trailer. I thought this is going to be the best thing ever. Okay. Foundation is A lot of people died in it, though. Like, I mean, I was, it was just boring. But mm. like, so much shit's disappointing. It was... It was okay, and I was okay. Yeah, with it, it okay. was it was solid. Like it was it was good, and that makes it better than all of the Hobbits and all of the new Star Wars. Uh, you know, the ball is on the green. Like you know, whether they take it home from there, they you know. We get some good New York sound effects here. Hey, you know, it's a busy world out there of of people who are living their lives completely unaware of any coins or. 
Yes, yeah, so we were talking about that in the last one. It's like most people have got no idea what's going on. Or care. But I think that that's going to continue. I mean, like uh, we're, you know, we are early. And part of being early is accepting that just, you know, the world will continue to not care about what we're doing, like for some large period of time, I think. Well, they might start caring over the next few years. I don't know. There, I'm not a big proponent of the doomsdayism like around Bitcoin. I think like predictions to the future. I, I don't know. I just feel like it's a very crass thing to predict that there will be some sort of societal collapse. Like it just seems very like bleak way to live your life. It's like you're rooting for that sort of thing. Like, <laughs> well, I, so I the funny thing is, I brought that up in the. Is uh, this the podcast? Yes, it's, it's, it's all. The, it's all the podcast. We can get back to talking. When did about it start? The, just you know, when, when you're a professional, <laughs> you just don't know when it's. Going. When did it start? I don't know. Okay. Sorry, I'm back. I'm, I pulled myself together again. First time we did this was two years ago here in New York City. Except I was the, I was the one with the studio. You were the one with the studio. Yeah. There was no cameras. Right. There, was, were, there, there were cameras that were in boxes, I think, to it, be fair. It was a little bit shit coiny. Oh, yeah. We weren't confident enough to set up the cameras, but you know, no. they, were they were present there. And uh, do you remember when it was? It was after Consensus 2019, yeah, in May. Se- mm-hmm. in September 19th. No, no. It's when you released the show, but you actually recorded it five months earlier because you came there after consensus, didn't think it was interesting enough, and then released it later. Is that what it is? Yeah, I must have been short. I have week. a great memory. I must have been, must, must have been <laughs> short show that week. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was really sem- September nineteenth. You did, yeah, but it occurred five months earlier because it was after consensus. I remember because I skipped the after party because I thought the event was terrible, so I hung out with you. The event was fucking it was, terrible. It was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. apologies. Yeah. Well, is, this is this the good. podcast? This, this is the podcast. <laughs> This is the podcast. So uh, it's a Bitcoin, uh, why is it 21 million? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, Satoshi realized that he needed to have a finite supply uh, to, you know, make number go up. I don't actually care. Yeah. We've covered this before. <laughs> is Bitcoin a I like the start push? that we had. Maybe we can like, kind of keep l- that. L- l- let me talk about that thing because you said uh, the doomsday thing. That's one of the things uh-huh. is like uh, it's the celebration of scenarios which are good for Bitcoin but ultimately yeah. Cause a lot of people other. I pain. think the word is gauche for that. Like it's a really. I, I think it's something we should frown upon. So just picture me frown. If you're listening, let's picture me frowning on it. Are we? Is this the podcast yet? Can it's, I refer to the podcast? You can. We. This whole time has been the podcast. <laughs> this is terrible. This is going to be the lowest viewed podcast. I think this is the most natural one, and people will love it. Okay, that's fair. I'm going to call okay. it a tale of two peeps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm. Re- I have to rebrand as Rizzo now. The tale of Rizzo. See, so the problem is like we haven't even really established these other prior jokes because like we haven't done like a, a reset, right? We don't need to. People, people are smart when they listen. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll they'll figure it out. And just for anyone who is just tuning in, uh, Peter McCormick is the dominant Peter. I, Pete Rizzo, formally renounced the Pete, and I am I am rebranding myself as Rizzo now. I am acknowledging Peter's claim to the entirety of the word Pete. I uh, never made a claim. Name. It just no, established to, yeah. itself. You got SEO, you've got, you know, you've got the domain authority. It's just it's a hard world out there, you know. It just established itself. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry I edged you out because you were you were probably the you were, yeah. no, Peter Todd was the original Peter. Peter Todd would have been the original Peter, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'm sure there were other Peters who were running around. Peter Vesinus from the Bitcoin Foundation, yeah. the classic one, classic Peter. Uh it's not that guy. Yeah, it doesn't have a great reputation. No. Uh, also, the one who was holding up the Mount Gox case for years. Yes. You know, so there's a, there's a proud lineage of Peters that we follow. <laughs> you know, I hate the name Peter. I we do. Such a, okay, well, now's your time to just renounce it's it. It's a know? very plain, <laughs> nothing fucking name, Peter. It means the rock, though, in, in, in Christian Does it? lore, I think. Now I like That's it what again. my grandmother told me. She know. might have made that up. <laughs> so, yes, no. we should not celebrate bad things bad events for people because it's a little bit crass. And I know, I agree, I do. I like sometimes, and I am I can be, everything I criticize, I can be a hypocrite. Mm-hmm. So I can tweet and put shit out there. But mm-hmm. uh, the collapse of society for the benefit of Bitcoin is not... Well, I think like where what I would say is that I think hyper Bitcoinization, should it occur within our lifetime, will be a very painful, disruptive process for a lot of people. And so, you know, since this is the podcast now, I'll refer to my work and just say, you know, as someone who tries to preserve the Bitcoin history, I, I do think we're going to owe those people some sort of explanation for what happens because my what I'm. My, my worry is that hyper Bitcoinization happens really fast, and you get something like what you saw in El Salvador, where you saw that Bitcoin is already politicized. It's a politicized issue in a single country in the world, and there's no reason to think that that kind of attack against Bitcoin can't scale. Right? Mm-hmm. There's a whole group of people in El Salvador, 50% of the population, who probably hate Bitcoin just because Bukele is for it. So I think with hyper Bitcoinization, it's definitely a lot less than 50%. 
I think oh, it's sure. like five percent of the people who are in the anti The gallery. protest is hardly anyone there. He's got so much popular support, mm -hmm. and it's arguably working. Mm. Well, I think my my point is just generally like about that is that I think hyper Bitcoinization will be painful for people. I think a lot of people won't understand it. And I think a lot of people, if you look at the cryptocurrency markets broadly, I think it's a good proxy for how people react to Bitcoin. Like you can't really understand it. Like part of the thesis like behind a lot of where I'm at and mentally is I think the history of Bitcoin is a series of human beings like trying and failing to understand Bitcoin. And I don't think that there's anything special about the current time period that we're living in that makes us immune from those mistakes. So I look at the other periods of Bitcoin history and I try to maintain a humble perspective because I know that those people were wrong. Everybody thought they were right. Everybody was retweeting them constantly and they were wrong. You don't hear about them anymore. And so my worry with the current group of Bitcoiners is that I, that I do think that they are correct in preaching about the monetization of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Bitcoin is monetizing at a at an insane rate. I think you can be, that is a very charitable description for how fast it's monetizing. Uh, that said, we should be very careful about the expectations that we set with new people uh, that are getting in that, you know, okay, you know, there's people are very, it's very easy for people to get into things and then think that they're special. Now is special. Now is a special time because we're here and I'm here and I'm special. So this must be special. Like hybrid Bitcoinization must be occurring within the next few months. Um, I don't think that's an accurate way to look at it. I, I think my proxy for hybrid Bitcoinization is, does, do people understand Bitcoin? No. So I don't know how hyper Bitcoinization occurs in that. Do most people who are in the cryptocurrency industry understand Bitcoin? No. So how are we at a place where hyper Bitcoinization can reasonably, can reasonably occur? And then if it does, it's going to be completely on the monetary brutality of Bitcoin and do you, is that how you want people to be introduced to Bitcoin? Like, how do how does somebody objectively claim they understand Bitcoin? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's I think the I think you notice those you know charts or tweets or people talking about the longer you've been here, like the more questions you have. And I think that's because some of those questions are very legitimate. Like, I mean, there are a lot of deeply meaningful questions left to resolve about Bitcoin, right? Like, we don't know that Bitcoin is going to work in an environment where the subsidy is not, you know, coming out from the supply, right? So that the the continual inflation, like we just don't know. Like we don't have that answer. You can't tell somebody that it that you know what's going to happen in that environment. There's been a couple studies that people have dismissed, but you know, Adam Back was talking about it recently <laughs> and his answer was uh I've been thinking about this a lot recently. He was like, yeah, well, you know, if Bitcoin's valuable, like people will figure out a way to pay for it. Like he's like, we have the internet and people pay for that. And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> I was like, wait, am I wrong? Because I'm looking for like a, a, a firm answer here about how Bitcoin is going to pay for itself in perpetuity. Whereas Adam Back's just like, man, it'll, it'll work if people like it. Well, the, the, the really strange thing about I find about Bitcoin, I look at something like Ethereum, like they're always changing and playing silly bollocks with it. But with something like Bitcoin, Everything seems to always just work out. <laughs> it does. They just qualify, you know, Mount, qualify that. I don't. I don't. M Mount Gox collapses mm. and could be the end of Bitcoin, but ends up being the start of a movement. Yeah, but, for but not you your were keys. just laughing. You were just laughing about cream finance earlier. So why does that example not apply? That's a bad example. Well, because that keeps <laughs> happening again and again. But what happens? It keeps is, happening in Bitcoin too. Like I mean, what? Well, <laughs> I feel like it's. Let's, we don't even have to talk about ETH, but I'm just saying it established the not your keys, not your Bitcoin, it, that movement to protect your Bitcoin. Like Silk Road yeah. could have ended Bitcoin and had regulatory crackdown, but we didn't have it. Like everything just seems to work out. It's like Harry Suddock said. Harry yeah. Suddock said to me, everything is good for Bitcoin. Bad things are good for Bitcoin and good things are good for Bitcoin, but they're always good for Bitcoin. Yeah, I have a trouble relating to that because, again, I, I, I always try to like, can you apply that perspective to someone in another coin? So like, you know, you look at these other coin communities the way they develop and they're almost like alternate realities like no, everything's you know, bad for ethereum uh, again qualify it yeah i don't i don't it doesn't make sense i i'm just being a pro yeah okay well I, hate <laughs> uh, I don't hate them I actually you have to take the alternative perspective so this yeah. was you had udi on the podcast recently and i think that was his main point right is that i think bitcoiners are have become so confident in bitcoin that by and large we've, we've become a bit complacent in actually making real argumentation for things you know, which well, I agree with him. I think that was a fair point. I don't think I have the reputation of someone who can make solid arguments. <laughs> I'm not going to start it right, right now. I need yeah. to think through it. I'm okay if I can mm. think, think things through over a bit of time. Well, I mean, okay. I spend a lot of time thinking things through. Everything yeah. is good for Bitcoin. Um, okay, I think what Harry meant by that is like, if if the price goes up, mm -hmm. it's good because it uh, value, like 
confirms the thesis that this is a valuable investment. Uh -huh. And if the price drops, it's a chance to buy more. Like everything's right. good for Bitcoin. Like you can argue with, I think what it is, is we have a way of arguing everything is good for Bitcoin. Volatility, right, yeah. that's the price you pay for remonetizing <laughs> Right. The world. But I think what's interesting about the other cryptocurrency communities is like, A, they do exist. Like you can objectively yep. see them. Uh, two, they parrot a lot of the things that, that Bitcoin does. And then they achieve a lot of the same results. So somebody said something interesting to me the other day, which is like, he was like, every coin has outperformed Bitcoin since it launched. Like basically all of them. And I was like, from a data perspective, that is a fairly accurate statement. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you how do you actually disprove that? Right. So I, I don't know. I, I so I'm a fan of argumentation. Uh I'm I'm a Bitcoiner who prefers my Bitcoin with some intellectual malaise. Well you know. somebody I was talking I was out to dinner last night and, and they were saying like they were questioning the podcast. It's like saying, like, what's your goal? And I was like, mm. I only ever want to have the best one. Mm. And she was like, does that mean the biggest? I was like, no. There's no way of measuring mm. this. You could have the most down. So as long as like you're happy with it, that's fine. Well, no, no. It's well, just like, well, let's apply this. Is everything good for your podcast? No. Um, I mean, <laughs> if I get arrested for for assaulting someone, that's not good for the it's podcast. It's not good for your podcast. If I go out no. on Twitter and and put okay. out homophobic, racist, stupid right. shit, that's not it's good. It's not good for your podcast. No. Okay. Because my 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 <laughs> Podcast is fragile, right? Okay, because it's it doesn't it won't operate without it's not decentralized. Your podcast right. is not decentralized. My death yeah. is not good for my podcast. Mm. That's good for everyone else's right. podcast, right? But the point being is like, well, you certainly for the other Peters like myself who are competing against your SEO and online presence, I think that would reestablish some room for you. Might reclaim the name, <laughs> no? But like the, the 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 point I'm trying to make is there was is, some bitterness in that in that last remark. By the way, there's like you might reclaim the name that we. <laughs> We, can we should free, freeze frame that. There should be like a slow pan on With a that. stir. Yeah. We, we should share it. But like, what I, the point I was trying to make is like, you, you could say, hey, whatever category of podcast, is it the best one? We, mm -hmm. It's the biggest. Oh, okay, so it's best in category. Yeah, but what makes something the best? Like, you can, what, is it just, is it just like a number? Is it the most downloaded? Well, are you the best Bitcoin podcast or the best crypto podcast? Uh, <laughs> I would say I'm not the best interviewer. That's uh, for sure. Yeah. I think uh, John Vallis is brilliant. Okay. I like Brady. He doesn't uh, do enough. Uh, yeah. I think Marty's a great interviewer. You listen to a lot of other Bitcoin podcasts. No, I used yeah. to, and okay. I stopped doing it. I yeah. will listen to specific ones. I'm going to listen to Vallis uh -huh. and Preston. I think Preston's a great interviewer. Right. I think I've just created the good entry point mm -hmm. and some marketing. That's mm -hmm. what it is. But the point being is, like, what 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 is the best? Is if if you if you say, oh, these other coins have outperformed Bitcoin, does that make them better? No, it doesn't, because that's not the metric. It's like cars. Right. If 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 uh, yeah, General that's, Motors. That, that's the question though: is what is the metric? And I think you know, you I know you want to talk about Bitcoin maximalism, but I I think that like you know, there are only so many ways to compare the different coins. You know, so you have to sort of I think like you know when you're when you you have to you have to understand the lens. You have to have yeah. a, a framework that works. And I think my what I've been trying to do with my work recently is like present a slight critique on Bitcoin maximalism. But I think we become too reliant on like emphasizing certain ideas. You know, so I, I have this kind of new thing that I've been saying where it's I think there's only really five ways to argue whether a cryptocurrency is better than another cryptocurrency. You've got economics, like it's you know. It meets the qualities of money better. There's the network. It's more decentralized by some metric. There's uh, the launch. It's like more fair by some determination that you're making. Uh, user rights, which I think is the, the big one that's kind of like under discussed, is like what rights do you have to use that protocol and under what conditions? And then five is really the freedoms. Like what freedoms do you have to use that money within that system? And I think most of the cryptocurrencies, really what they do that's, that's quite problematic, I think if you think about it, is that they offer you the veneer of more freedoms, often at a cost of like weakening the other perspectives. They're mm -hmm. less decentralized, they're less economically strong, and they often weaker, weaken your rights as a user within that system for some veneer of, oh, you can use all these apps or, or whatever, right? But uh, I think this comes down to one of the central issues with, you know, you say, what is Bitcoin, 21 million, whatever. Uh, the other cryptocurrencies are even less defined. I mean, I think at this point, you know, one of the big theories that we're unbundling right now is the crypto asset theory. I don't know that crypto assets exist. Please, someone show me that they that there is actually a cryptocurrency that is meaningfully differentiated from Bitcoin. There's a couple ways you can look at it. Either they're all competing economies, like financial economies, uh, or you should be able to prove that people are using some of these other cryptocurrencies for some reason, right? So a good example would be like privacy coins, quote unquote. Are people using them to do, to do things for privacy? No, then how do really. they exist as a meaningfully distinct asset? It seems like this is just another key pair on some chain. Uh, and then really what we're talking about is that all these networks essentially have a certain 
you know, you can grade them on some sort of uh, curve for something, but I think they're competing economies. And I think that's really the heart of one of the disagreements between Bitcoin and Ethereum ecosystem is they're essentially the two largest crypto economies, but there are real meaningful differences between these things, right? And I think that, um, you know, if, you, if you're someone who's understanding those, of those things or you can help the conversation, I think you have a responsibility to do that because it is very confusing for people. We, we as human beings are just starting to learn what the differences of these systems are. But humans are also really great at making large, complex systems that are terrible. Look at the fiat system, mm -hmm. a terrible system of human invention. So uh, again, I think that like we're immune from making these kind of mistakes in the system. I think like that's where I, I want to push back against some of the sort of hand-waving where, where people are like, oh, well, you know, don't be a Bitcoin maximalist. You should just, you know, let all these other cryptocurrencies exist. Well, no, these actually, these are systems that have meaningfully different uh, attributes for their users. And if extrapolated, if allowed to grow <laughs> into large systems, uh, they could have meaningful effects on the lives of many people. We're at the stage right now where cryptocurrencies are have been launched now in multiple multiple countries. Venezuela launched a cryptocurrency. Everybody forgets about that. <laughs> Nobody uh, fucking used it. <laughs> right, yeah. But El Salvador, you know, again, like embraced Bitcoin. Very cool. But, you know, again, these things are being applied on a national scale now. And, uh, you know, again, the sort of like rainbow type, you know, approach that Ethereum has taken, I think, you know, had its time and place, right? Like there was a time and place where maybe that was that was an interesting thing to do. But I think at this point, you know, we know a little bit more about these systems. So, so I yeah. can't tell your position on this. Like you, I always feel like you're uh, a contrarian, but a fair contrarian, mm -hmm. right? Like a, fair, almost like you're a journalist. Mm -hmm. That um, was my uh, occupation for some period of time. But I feel like I feel like you've gone through a period of becoming a little bit more pro. Like Bitcoin, a bit more. Yeah, for sure. I, I would call like, myself a Bitcoin maximalist yeah. because I, I felt like back in 2019. I'm not sure if it was just you were disillusioned with work, disillusioned yeah. with the whole economy, there but you, there was definitely disillusionment. And I left that first interview thinking, huh, huh okay. And then we, with all your recent work, I'm like, oh no, he's like full Bitcoin maxi. I, I I didn't have the context, so I think the thing that's helps to understand is, is I'll explain sort of like why I think my story is valuable and I've become a little bit more comfortable telling it. So hmm. I was someone who became a journalist in 2013 when I discovered Bitcoin and that was my vehicle to becoming a journalist. So I had a relationship where Bitcoin was a means for me to attain the job that I wanted to do. Right. So, uh, you know, a lot of my recent statements and being like pro toxic maximalism, you know, I basically said as such that I was a person who was in a position of, a th of to do something to educate the public about Bitcoin. And I think I worked very hard at that. I, you know, worked 12, 14 hours a day. I ultimately built a new source that's still one of the largest in the industry. It scaled to be a global publication that had 50 people by the time I left. Was that organization some positive for Bitcoin? I don't think so. I didn't have the knowledge at that point to really even understand that, that I didn't have the per perception of myself in that role. So I think, you know, when I go back and I look at the people who attacked me and they were ruthlessly in attacking my position, they were often right in doing so because I hadn't taken the time to understand what this thing was. You know, I just didn't have that perspective because I was doing my job. My job was to report the news. The media organization benefited from us covering multiple cryptocurrencies. There was better SEO across all fronts. These are no different than any of the reasons that any of the businesses today do not support multiple cryptocurrencies. There is a widespread belief within the cryptocurrency industry that supporting multiple cryptocurrencies is ultimately the best business decision. How do you argue against that? You can. The business performs meaningfully better across all those metrics if you support multiple cryptocurrencies. So that's the direction that business went. Well, yes and no. Like there is a time preference well, you, thing. Well, you counter traded that a bit with your podcast, right? How do you mean? Well, like I went Bitcoin only. Yes. Yeah, but I but I will accept money for sponsorship from companies that support crypto. I just right. won't promote their products. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've had it up on my website. You have to have a Bitcoin product. Mm -hmm. I'm only willing to... Uh, right. promote that because there are not enough Bitcoin only companies with enough money to pay for the ads to support what this machine has become. Right. And I'm okay with that because I only you know I only promote Bitcoin. But there is a time preference argument on this thing. So for example, there are exchanges that support multiple cryptocurrencies and then there's River and there's Strike essentially and Cash App is kind of mm -hmm. only Bitcoin. It's like what's the long term trajectory? These companies that are building their business as a Bitcoin only company, perhaps a building something which is more resilient long term, whereas the other exchanges that support multiple cryptocurrencies, right. they, they perhaps 
aren't building for the same future. They're building for a future of maybe being a securities exchange. What does that mean? Well, I would argue that if you look at the cryptocurrency companies, you, you could argue that they support multiple cryptocurrencies, but I'm not even sure that that's actually true. I think they mostly support Ethereum-based, they, they mostly support tokens within the Ethereum economy. So again, if you look at them as competing financial uh, economies, you have Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, then I think it's a little bit easier to slice that, right? The Ethereum, yeah. being a participant of the Ethereum economy is like more lucrative for you, more trading fees, more coins, more everything, more news, more data, you know, you name it, right? So I think, yeah, I have become a bit more of a Bitcoin maximalist because, you know, I left very, very dissolutioned, as you said. Yep. I, you know, I I was <laughs> the editor uh, during the block size wars, right? You, you had people who were, the foremost experts in the industry fighting with each other every day about what the thing was. So I don't know how you don't leave that thing to solution, but I resolved to eventually just try to go find my own answer. And you know, I basically was said, okay, I'm gonna give it all up. I'm gonna go back to the beginning. I'm gonna start at page one and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna actually learn this thing because I don't know what happened. Right. But I think that that to me, I, I you know, I took some time off between that and ultimately I was like, okay, I was here, I have to know. I was in a position where I can know. Right, and I think I decided that for me that was what I wanted to follow up with. Right, yep. I think we were just talking with uh, your friend over there, you know, saying, "Oh, these history stories are helpful. They give me context." And I was like, "They give me context because mm -hmm. I knew thirty percent of this story, but I had to go back and, and get it because I didn't know if someone else was going to do that work." And talking about what we talked at the beginning, I hope this is the beginning of the podcast <laughs> with hyper Bitcoinization <laughs> is like I think we owe some. We're going to owe some explanation to these people. And I say these people being the the people of the world who I think when Bitcoin becomes a competitive uh, financial economy, that it is is going to be thrust upon them as when? Well, when? What do you mean? Kind of is now. I don't. I I think it's still very ignorable. I think the Bitcoin economy is still very ignorable. I think it's the, the dollar. The dollars don't matter. It's not about the dollars. Sixty thousand dollars, and everybody on the street. Nobody's talking about this. Nobody in this office is probably talking about this. The dollars don't matter. I got in a, when I started writing about Bitcoin. It was the price was fifty dollars. Never thought I would see a thousand. Saw a thousand. Never saw. Thought I would saw twenty thousand. Saw twenty thousand. Never thought I would see sixty thousand. And what has been the big change in the world? I think the thing is that people don't really understand that the Bitcoin price is not correlated to the adoption of Bitcoin. It's correlated to the economic strength of the Bitcoin network. Those are two separate things. And I think because of that, Explain I, that. Okay, I'm able to be bullish on the price of Bitcoin mm -hmm. without thinking that that bullishness on the price translates into real world change. I don't think that those things are equal at this point. I think we've, we have seen that. Bitcoin, again, has been worth more than a dollar for a decade. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone's walking around using dollars. <laughs> so uh, I think we, we tend to overestimate the effect of the price psychologically on people, right? We'll have this conversation well, in four it, years, and I guarantee you the price will be $600,000, and no one will care. But it, it can also be <laughs> counterproductive. It actually turns people off because they're like, I've missed it. I'm too late. Forget this. Uh, but people are, I mean, I thought I was too late at $50. I mean, that's just a symptom of the adoption curve. That's yeah. how Bitcoin, I think, works. I think you have to sort of see over time that it's more beneficial for you to be a participant in the Bitcoin economy. You know, the, you are rewarded for being a participant in the Bitcoin economy at an outsized level than the fiat economy. You know, they're not. You're not rewarded in that system. You're punished usually, unless you're yes. unless you're the billionaires, the cantillionaires. That seems to be the case. I mean, I'm I've been appreciative of all the recent like macro discussion around Bitcoin. I certainly didn't understand economic macroeconomics, and I don't think there's been much talk about macroeconomics in Bitcoin prior to this last two or three years. But again, I still find some of these things, as you were saying, like to be wildly like overcharacteristic. I mean, I think the price could, of Bitcoin can go up to six hundred thousand dollars. I just don't think the world meaningfully changes. As long as you can put Bitcoin in a box as silly digital gold, like it's not going to change. the The real change is not correlated to price. I think the mistake that we made is not in predicting higher prices. I do think the Bitcoin price will continue to go higher. It's that it, thinking that that in any way necessitates or equals some sort of meaningful change. So what, what does bring meaningful change to I you? I think that's the question. I don't know. You know, and the other flip side question is like, are we ready to onboard that many people? Like, are we, can we actually handle? You know, people like to use the Bitcoin as a lifeboat analogy. Okay, great. How many lifeboats do you have? Not for everybody. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. So I don't know how that's going to work out. So is it? Does it end up just being this smaller shadow economy? No, I'm I'm pro a longer cyclical theory. So I had a chance. So you're talking about interviewing. Uh, I only had a chance to ask Greg Maxwell one question. Okay. And I said, do you care if Bitcoin succeeds within your lifetime? And he said no. 
And I think I got more from that question than anything else because I think that we have to understand we might not see the end of the revolution that we're starting. This is very common. I mean, like the the founding fathers never saw America become a global superpower. That, that they died. They <laughs> they're like well before that. So I think we have to sort of appreciate that that this thing may take time. I don't think that's bad. I don't know who I don't know who needs Bitcoin to hyper Bitcoinize in the next two years, and I think it's mostly people on Twitter like need that to happen. Uh, so therefore, I just I don't think it's a meaningful discussion point. I guess the question would be like, okay, from a from a is the world better off if people do that? And I think then it becomes you know the answer is I think yes. I think Bitcoin as a financial asset seems to protect people's rights at a higher level than the existing system. So it's going to be. Uh, well, I was reading when I was on holiday. I was reading about the the last days of Rome. Okay, <laughs> fuck. I didn't realize. I mean, this is the, but this this whole story. Is Were you wearing like board shorts? Like, did you have like a some like sun lotion on your nose? Like, you oh, just come on. <laughs> but this like this story pans hundreds of years. They talk about uh, like sections which are like decades. This is why history is very dangerous. Yeah, but hundreds of years. See, look at you. You're a person going back to history for answers to understand your time in the present. I'm trying to understand the fourth turning. And if we're in it, I'm trying to understand if this is one of those situations because yeah. it's. I like the fourth turning theory, to be yeah. honest. But, but the, the fourth kinda, turning was the fall of Rome. But like the fall yeah. of Rome was, like I say, it was, <laughs> it was hundreds of years, right? The people right, who yeah. were the start when they're not there at the end, just like you said, just mm. exactly as you've said. And so this hyper Bitcoinization might be something that is decades, maybe yeah. a couple of centuries, and it's ugly, messy, painful, mm. bloody. It could be awful. It could, but, but it's what comes out at the end of it. I think there's a couple questions that I look at. I look at it as sort of, I think prior to hyper-Bitcoinization, there will be a meaningful transition to something else. And this is what really worries me about the cryptocurrency movement beyond Bitcoin and why I'm increasingly in the columns or for Forbes or Bitcoin Magazine, whatever, trying to delineate between those two things. Because I do think that Bitcoin is not the cryptocurrency movement, right? Sure. The cryptocurrency movement... I still have very many questions about. I think the most troubling thing about all the other cryptocurrencies other other than Bitcoin is that they seem to take a certain attitude towards, um, th there are common attitudes, right? So I think I, I really like to look at it as there's two financial ecosystems emerging. There's the Bitcoin economy and there's the crypto economy. So then you sort of look at it and like, what do people in each of these categories believe? Well, one, I, so, look, I'm going to be brutal here. I think Bitcoin is based on a strong set of principles yes. of security, sound money, you know, move slowly, glacial, and then you have competing cryptocurrencies which seem to have disaster after disaster and no one gives a fuck. No, that's, not, that, 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 that's a bad argument because you already brought up Mt. Gox and Bitcoin already. You already said no, no, that no, but everything saying, that happens no, 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 no. Key difference. Argument. People did care about Mt. Gox. It led to a whole movement of knock your keys, not your Bitcoin. Yeah. Whereas what I'm saying is these cryptocurrencies seem to go from disaster to disaster. Nobody gives a fuck. It becomes more centralized. Don't care. Can't run a node. Don't care. Rug pull for a billion. Don't right, care. Right, but those those things, so why do those things matter that you just said? So I think the reason that they matter, it matters that other cryptocurrencies are not meaningfully decentralized, not because they're not meaningfully decentralized. It's because you as a user in a system that is not meaningfully decentralized have less rights. It's more likely for you to be exploited. So the, the way that I could best put it, I think, in a recent piece that I wrote was like, in other cryptocurrencies, it's possible for political groups to form, for those political groups to take action, and then for you as a user within that system to be disenfranchised. You can lose access to that system. And I think what's really troubling about the cryptocurrency market is that what when they look at that situation is that they they're very majoritarian, right? They basically say, uh, you know, you who are using our product uh, and oh, you don't like it, you can just go fork our code. You can just go appeal to the market for whatever you want to use, continue using whatever you want. And it, it puts the market in a weird position where the market almost adjudicates people's rights. In Bitcoin, your rights are guaranteed. They're in the code. There's no political formation that can form that can collude against you where you won't have access to your Bitcoin. We've seen this time and time again. And there are groups within Bitcoin who have meaningfully dissented, that they don't follow the rules of the majority and are still owning Bitcoin. This is, a, I think, a massive delineation between the two systems. Is in Bitcoin, these the way that we're pursuing changes to the economy are, are optional. They're voluntary. Sure, there may be, there's, and there's debate here about what is use of force and, and how, but it, by and large in the cryptocurrency ecosystem, if you don't agree with the majority and whatever coin you're on, take a hike, get lost, go somewhere else. 
You know, if you want to fork the code, great. Go talk to all the exchanges and get them to list your coin. And in certain cases, that has even been, you know, they've removed people's rights to their own money. This was the DAO hack, which I think is, you know, again, where history has, I think, still focused on that event because it was is a situation where the majority of users of Ethereum colluded to rescind somebody's rights. <laughs> they just took away that guy's money. And so what worries me, I guess, talking about hyper-Bitcoinization is that we're going to pass through some stage where these cryptocurrencies are actually meaningfully subverted by the state apparatus. Because I think... If you're if you're thinking that the, the the government is just going to regulate all the cryptocurrencies away, I think you're in for a rude awakening. They will exploit those systems to their benefit mm -hmm. prior to hyper Bitcoinization occurring. Because by the time they realize that hyper Bitcoinization is occurring, they will fight it tooth and nail. I don't think it's going to be a very rosy process for us. It probably well too late to fight it. And there's a, there's another argument yes, that we were discussing that, yeah. in the previous interview I had with Lawrence Lapard, where we were discussing actually the Bitcoin in some ways could be a savior of the U.S. economy and the U.S. dollar. We'll come back to that. Just keep that in check because I just want to You're refer back. back. <laughs> well, I, I think another thing that's important, difference, differential, differential between Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, I think is you know, the objective of not everyone but some of the people. I think the overall kind of goal, objective of Bitcoin, outside of everyone wanting to get rich, is there's like these issues in society that these bad money causes that people think good money can fix. So that, that's the principle of what they're trying to do. Fix the money, fix the world. You might think it's hyperbolic, but that exists. There, a, well, I mean, I yeah, I think that's the way you framed it is, is interesting, but we can put that in a well, box. We can come back, come back to that. But the point being is there's like some principles of, about Bitcoin making the world a better place. Yeah, but whose principles and, and where did they come again, from? Again, I know every point I make, we're going to digest as like <laughs> the minutia detail, but... but but with cryptocurrency, I think uh, they're trying to innovate technology, and it's kind of fintech. I just, yeah, I don't buy that. I think no, I that don't. I don't think that's an accurate way of looking at it. Okay, tell me why. Because the shittiest cryptocurrency inherits ninety percent of the characteristics that make Bitcoin money. Like just by virtue, of, like Dogecoin is a great example. <laughs> like so, if you took Viat, Dogecoin, and Bitcoin. Dogecoin is a terrible cryptocurrency; it has absolutely no value, but it still inherits a lot of the characteristics of Bitcoin by roughly being a fork of it. So like, I mean, this is sort of one of the arguments of altcoinism is that, uh, you know, it's this, you should have this pure freedom of expression. Anything you want to be able to do, you should be able to do it. But again, like the Dogecoin is, you know, uh, you can grade it on the same curve, right? Uh, economically, is it better than the dollar? I don't know. Dogecoin's had a great year. Uh, the network, is it decentralized? Definitely not. Nobody's nobody's running that code. The mm -hmm. launch, was it fair? Uh, I don't know. The guy gave up, he left. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, user rights. Uh, okay, well, if the majority of Elon Musk fans decide to do something else with Dogecoin, you're probably not going to last very long. Uh, and you could trade it everywhere, anywhere in the world with probably about the same settlement time as Bitcoin. So, I don't think yeah. it has the same liquidity as Bitcoin. Sure. But, and and it certainly has, doesn't have the same network effects. It doesn't have the same respect. Right, but it has 90. What, what I'm saying is that one of the interesting things about this argument is that the average cryptocurrency, by virtue of being copying what Bitcoin achieved, copies 90% of Yeah, but the, you can copy 100% of what Bitcoin does and you'll still fail because you don't have the network effect. You don't have the launch. You, you're not it. So when not having that 10%, you, you, you know... And, what are we talking about? You can talk about the percent of features it has, but it right. doesn't. That what did, that's, that's kind of like a. I think that's a meaningless metric. Because I would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all these other cryptocurrencies can launch, but they don't seem to. I don't feel behind them. There's ever a kind of mission, which is like Bitcoin's. Yeah, Bitcoin Cash would say it has a similar mission, maybe. Right. Yeah. But 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 it's failed. What I'm saying is, generally I, speaking, I think Bitcoin has a very different mission. Can Ethereum define its mission? I, I think that's one of the central problems with yeah. Ethereum. <laughs> like, as I don't think, I think, you know, if you think about cryptocurrencies, most of them are predicated on what they're doing is not Bitcoin. Because what they're doing is not Bitcoin, they can take liberties with you know Everything. user rights and whatever the network design, whatever. Uh, and that the U, this is the most problematic that the U.S. dollar value of their coin, uh, you know, is what. Uh, gives what approves their decision or not. They look to the U.S. dollar market to validate their decisions. Mm -hmm. That is one of the most overwhelmingly problematic things about most current cryptocurrencies that I feel like nobody talks about is that they have a different relationship to the market. I think with Bitcoin maximalism, Bitcoin is definitional. It is a neutral monetary system by design, irregardless of any approval of the market. If Bitcoin decided, if Bitcoin was worth half as much tomorrow, it would still be a neutral monetary system. Mm -hmm. 
I think with the other cryptocurrencies, one of the things that we don't talk about enough is how intertwined they've become with the US dollar cryptocurrency market, which again, didn't actually exist at the beginning of Bitcoin. There was no US dollar crypto, uh, Bitcoin market for the first year of Bitcoin. So therefore the US dollar cryptocurrency market is a weird abstraction. It, it both doesn't actually exist, but it's used to validate 99% of the interactions in the cryptocurrency community. And I think that's one of the things why I think Bitcoiners, you know, as much as you want to cheer on the price, like you have to kind of divorce yourself from it a little bit. Because I don't think, to me, Bitcoin maximalism is partly it's, you know, we're not looking to the price for validation. I think Bitcoin achieves what it achieves. And I think if you're looking to the US dollar market for validation, I don't, I don't know. I think that's I think that's a problem because you know, what's the score system there? I feel like you've US just dollar? you've just we've gone around in a circle, you've ended up agreeing with my thesis. Okay. Because Fine. Because I believe Bitcoin is based on principles, fixed money, fixed right, right, world, right, right, yeah. and that, then that isn't and the only measure. The US dollar measure is like it's, it feels like it's growth. And you well, I don't even know how much principles it is. It's just that because you own Bitcoin, you can't be disenfranchised. Yeah. Therefore, you can never you can never be kicked out. Like yeah. I don't even know how much the Bitcoin principles that we load on Bitcoin like really matter. It's like you own your keys in Bitcoin, and no one can take them away from you. Whereas in the other cryptocurrencies some group or collection of groups can collude to take them away from you. Well, I feel like the roadmap is net, the roadmap, the technical roadmap for Bitcoin, the development roadmap has got nothing to do with improving the valuation of Bitcoin. It's to do with improving the experience of the user, making, making the uh, network more decentralized, making it more secure. I feel like they all, it's always for the better, like making the technology better. I feel like mm-hmm. when you look at something like Ethereum, well, they change the monetary policy multiple times. Right. Yeah, they try and put in all but these like, But features. I think people focus on the monetary policy and they don't focus on the user. So why is it better for you to be a user in a system with a fixed monetary policy? Well, no one else can influence it. It's worse mm. for you to be a user in a system with a changing monetary policy because you might not necessarily be able to influence the outcome and yeah. you might be disenfranchised by the people making the decisions. There has to be someone making the decision there. So I think like my problem is not with the arguments of decentralization or the arguments about the economics being important. I think it all goes back to like you as a user, right? Are mm. you in a in a financial economy where where you can proceed without some penalty being enacted against you. And Bitcoin, it seems overwhelmingly obvious that as much as all of our, the way we're upgrading Bitcoin now occurs in a way where you are not penalized for non-participation. And the other cryptocurrencies, they're definitionally, they require participation. Or you are not on the, you, you do not continue being a part of the network. So they become almost weirdly authoritarian. <laughs> so that's why I think the right way to look at it is Bitcoin. I think Safedian said this recently. It's it's an economy defined by consent, mm-hmm. and cryptocurrencies are by and large economies defined by political influence. And again, my worry is that as we're talking about hyper Bitcoinization, I don't think the world accepts hyper Bitcoin as hyper Bitcoinization until it goes through some really weird experimentation with the other system. So I think that's what, like to me. I, I expect to see some period of time where it's pretty painful to be a Bitcoiner because uh, because these systems can be subverted, right? Like they, uh, let's just say you had a large amount of nation states embrace Ethereum, all launch, uh, you know, fiat proxy coins on Ethereum, gather political influence there. Most people would probably just go along with their lives. I don't know how much it would affect them. Like, but that's no different from them going along with the fiat currencies we have now. They're just right. on a different platform. They, they're still subject to the same issues. Right, I think so. I just think that um, you know it'll be under the guise of this different change, right? People will be saying, "Oh, well, this is just like Bitcoin because it's also decentralized," <laughs> right? So you'll have this period where, like, I think it'll get, and I think even some of those coins, right? Like, um, I, I, I think we should prepare ourselves mentally for a, a point in the future where, where you know, this U.S. dollar cryptocurrency market market is used against us, right? I don't think Bitcoin is going to be number one on that random chart that we all don't believe in forever. Mm -hmm. And so then when it's number two by some metric, you know, does your whole worldview collapse at this point? I don't know. Like, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think for me. But I think, you know, again, the more we focus on the price, the number go up. And, you know, I think we become susceptible to those types of attacks. Like, I remember why are most people come to cryptocurrency? They come here for... You know, what is it? Uh, Come for the games. Up. It's a Trojan horse, right? Come for the gains, stay for the tech, stay right. for the sale money. Right. Yeah. So I, I think my thing is that um, 
I don't know. I, I just think that I like to, to the extent that I can use these conversations to get people to think about situations that might be difficult for us as Bitcoiners. You know, I don't know if we're going to chuckle and meme our way to hyper Bitcoinization and you're going to have women in bikinis working on your Citadel acting <laughs> as farm hands. And I think you've seen that tweet, which makes it even funnier. <laughs> so listen, look, so this Bitcoin maximalism thing it's, yeah. and toxic, maximal, yeah. toxic maximalism, it's, it's a topic I've struggled with. I've gone back yeah. and forth on it. And I think I've gone back on it when I've just been attacked myself and I've felt it's brutal. And there's other times where I've seen people like get attacked. I'm like, oh, just shut the fuck up. It's Twitter. It doesn't matter. Right. Stop being a pussy. I, I have wrestled with it. And I think there's like a couple of areas. There's like toxic maximalism around the protocol mm. and there's toxic maximalism around other cryptocurrencies. Yeah. And I think they're two kind of separate points that kind of overlap. Well, and also against people. And I think, yeah. you know, where I am pro the toxic maximalist because I was in a position to enact change and I wasn't using that position as responsibly as I could have. I was doing my job. I did my job great. But that doesn't preclude the fact that I didn't really have the context to be doing it. And I needed people to be doing that. I needed that. I didn't, it took me so long to come to that realization that, that I was wrong. Because again, you have to remember that we're going to continue this grand experiment and everybody's going to be doing their job, right? So the toxic maximalist, I think, you know, are you in a position to enact change? If yes, then you should expect people to be acerbic to you because you are, again, if you really believe that Bitcoin is the great emancipator that is going to give you know people financial rights in perpetuity into the future, then that is how you justify that action. And I think it becomes justifiable against people who are in a position to do better. And I think, you know, for me, I had to step aside and come back to it and figure out my own way there because I don't like listening to other people. So I, for me, it was a very painful experience. So in hindsight, what what should you have done differently? I don't know. I don't know because I, don't I think you. I was a I was a journalist. I built a media company, and I built that media company first to cover Bitcoin and then to cover cryptocurrency. I think you can speculate what you would have could have done differently. Like what uh, outcome? What should the outcome have been? What should should it have been a Bitcoin media company. I think I I could have had more context to understand what Bitcoin was and why it was important enough to push back against the people who tried to subvert and change that and who have largely now gone into the cryptocurrency general community and are largely still believe the same things that they used to believe. So it's not so much about whether CoinDesk covers Bitcoin or crypto, it's more the editorial angle it took towards those attacks. I think yes, the the uh, the the way that it was adopted at the time, it was, you said this, he said that, article with both opinions, proceed. Uh, but again, there wasn't the access to this understanding of like the, the history and context, right? I didn't, I, nobody knew how Bitcoin worked. I remember going to the first Scaling Bitcoin conference and and legitimately, I no, I just had no idea how the open source Bitcoin project functioned. Like there wasn't something that was at the conferences. You'd go to the conferences and there'd be some libertarian guy with a cowboy hat yelling about the dollar. Like there wasn't some guy like Joseph Poon presenting the Lightning Network and saying, "Here's how distributed hashes work, and here's why you know multi-layered payment channels on top of Bitcoin will expand the network." They're just everybody moved past that. I think one of the things about the 2013 era that's like really interesting is that everybody took for granted that we were here to build startups on Bitcoin. Bitcoin had won, all coins didn't matter, and all of a sudden we were there was going to be this great boom of like startup innovation on top of Bitcoin. So, okay, great. Like, nobody learned anything about the Bitcoin protocol. I didn't have anybody that I worked with at Coindesk that knew any more than I did. <laughs> like, who else knew anything? We were just, like, my, my CEO was a former pickup artist. That Like, that was his job prior to being the CEO of the, of the Bitcoin media company is that he literally was... You know, Neil Strauss. he was he was ranked nationally. He was ranked internationally too. But like, you how know, do you get ranked? In, what he was ranked internationally as a pickup artist. Yeah, who are we talking about? Are we talking about Perry. I don't know if I and I literally just literally just say on this podcast, but I think I've I've said enough for this internet sleuths out there. Ah, Jesus. But like, who was I going to ask about Bitcoin? Right, like nobody knew. Right, so I think that this is one of the things where I I, I continue to think that human understanding is lagging Bitcoin's progress. And I don't necessarily think we live in an era right now where we know it all, right? Like, I don't think we have all the answers. There are some people who think we do, and I'm happy to disagree with them, but I don't think we know 100% of what Bitcoin is just yet. So in those fields, uh -huh. protection of the protocol, tackling individuals, 
tax versus other cryptocurrencies. Uh-huh. What is the role of toxic maximalism? And is it anything goes? I mean, free speech is anything goes. But like, is there things that that you look upon you you consider poor behavior, or could, is anything goes? The way I look at it is differently. I'd say like, w- if would you? Why does Peter McCormick not have a crypto show? So the reason <laughs> Peter McCormick doesn't have a crypto show is he started out as a crypto show, right? And Toxic you Max. had some meaningful engagement with the Bitcoin community. <laughs> Toxic Maximus, particularly Shinobi, who <laughs> right, yeah, I was friends okay. with. And now we're not friends. We're in a we're in a period of divorce. Are you guys not friends? Okay. We, we got divorced. Mm. Uh, we might get back together at some point, but wow. we're having a period off from each other. He, he was very upset that I interviewed Pete Ryzen, another Peter. Right, I remember that. Yeah, fucking Peters everywhere. And mm-hmm. I was about to get on a plane, and he was giving me shit. Uh-huh. And we had a call and had, had an argument. And I ended up getting on this flight from New York to Hong Kong. Right. So, so, so this is an this is an Pre- anecdote where toxic on. maximalism had an effect on on you as a creator. It did. It did. Um, but there was two effects. But I get on this flight. It's fifteen hours, and I land in Hong Kong. I switch on my phone. It's just like it's gone mm-hmm. wild. My phone mm-hmm. went into meltdown, mm-hmm. and it was. But it was both sides. There was people supporting, people against. Mm-hmm. So I, I went to this conference, and it was funny because it was a uh, what was it called? It's the one in Hong Kong, Token 2049. Oh, okay. That's fun. And yeah. I'm hosting people on stage. That's the one where Vitalik stood up and heckled Craig Wright. Was that yeah, it? I was yeah. at a different one, though, a different year. Yeah. And there was a point where I had to introduce Justin Sun on stage. I was oh, like, nice. Oh. Okay. So that happened. I was like, mm. at that conference, I was like, do you know what? One, I think they're right. Like, Bitcoin. But you had no intellectual basis at that point. To no, no, no. That. One, they think, but one, I think they're <laughs> right because right. there's like, there's safety in there selling this book. In mm-hmm. the corner, and there's Justin Sun with his entourage. I was just like, "This is hard work. This is bullshit." But the other thing, I was like, "There's so much happening here in this crypto space. If I can just win Bitcoin, uh-huh. my career's good. I'm going to be uh-huh. good. So fuck it. I'll do this. I'll go right. Bitcoin only." And then in high school, I'm like, "I should have been like this from the start." You know? Right. I feel like that. This is a good example. I think the toxic maximalists, while they they're were, much they were ben- right. benign, but they're they're often maligned by the people who seemingly have benefited the most from following like what <laughs> what they're doing. Right. Like, look, if you're good to Bitcoin on on Twitter, Twitter is great to you. So why not why not keep doing that? But again, I, th- I question the intellectual basis for some of the stuff. We, you know, my problem with toxic Bitcoin maximalism is not that it exists. It's just that you know. I think it, it becomes a little bit like, um, you know, the wolf's policing the sheep, you know? And then at the end of the day, it's like all you've done is created a bunch of sheep. You know? So I think with tox- the toxic maximum and stuff, I think it's good to the extent that it can f- fulfill its function, which is to hold people accountable. Like you had a platform. People attacked you because they didn't feel you were using that platform meaningfully and you adjusted. I think I made, this, this, I made the same call. Uh, but I think at the same time, like, you know, that came with an intellectual exploration. You actually adjusted that and your show followed that and you asked people questions and you got the expertise. So I don't understand how people can sit there and then argue that toxic maximalism isn't relevant or that it should somehow stop because it seems to be responsible for a lot of things that of people using their platforms like more correctly. But does, but does it ever go too far? Because there, there is a group, I feel like there's, Toxic max- maximalists, mm-hmm. and then this just group of fucking morons. Well, this who is the I've problem. Block yeah. them all. Who seem to have? They're not. It's not based on principle. I think themselves. They're based on. Oh, I get to shout at somebody, and people yeah, like this, right. and then I get to harass, and and I and and they got this feedback loop, and mm. they suddenly, yeah, they're probably just in life generally losers, mm. and <laughs> this this no, they probably are because like you can see by the way they. I think you can be. T- I think Adam Back is one of the best toxic maximalists, and he never loses his cool. Uh, he's harsh, and his Twitter's a little. But but if you read it, he's savage and rational at the right time. I've never understood an Adam Back tweet. I think the, the amount of no, likes that true. he gets for tweets that like a normal person would tweet, and yeah, but he's Adam Back, <laughs> right? Yeah. So just retweet anything that he says. Don't trust verify. But my right? point is, is like, and then there's the people who literally harass, abuse, and threat, threaten people, and mm-hmm. and I just think these people they can't make an intellectual argument. But they've probably spent their life as a loser, and they'll probably always be a loser. But so there's this little circle of their. Ah, life. but herein lies the thing: is that, I, and this is where I think the the historical lineage of toxic maximalism is that within the Bitcoin system, you cannot be disenfranchised. 
The thing about the other inherently political financial systems is in the fiat world, you can be disenfranchised because of your behavior. If you do something that someone doesn't like, they could take their bank account away, your bank account mm -hmm. away. They can come after you. You can be canceled. In Bitcoin, you can. So I see toxic maximalism as the justification being it is a celebration of how in Bitcoin you cannot be disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Do some people go too far with that? Probably. But ultimately, what they're doing is still something that is only possible because of the technology of Bitcoin. In any other context, they would they will be would have been people who would be canceled, muted, otherwise, you know, rejected from the platform. But well, in Bitcoin, yeah. they remain. But they can be canceled on the other centralized platforms, be it Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, right. which is happening. Right. Which is happening. And I think this is why toxic Bitcoin maximalism to me is is actually a celebration of something that makes the Bitcoin protocol unique. And mm -hmm. if you look at the history of how it emerged, like it really tracks well with that. Toxic Bitcoin maximalism was a tool that people used to check the power of the developers mm -hmm. because it wasn't always the case that we have Bitcoin the way we had now. So if you come to the conclusion there's no downside to it, therefore we embrace it. I just think there's no... I can buy that. There's no... <laughs> like it, it just seems, seems like such a silly thing to rail against because what are you really railing against? You're railing against people criticizing you. Again, this is why I tweeted something about this. It's like how you react to it, you, you get to decide that. Uh, Lynn if you can't take criticism, and then yeah, she wrote a great tweet about this. It's like, just like yeah, you it's know, brilliant. you know, it, I think it's just you know, if you can't, if you don't have the humility to take what those people are saying, divorce yourself from the emotion of it, and then come to a conclusion, then I don't know what to tell you. You're just no, probably no better than them, right? So I think in this situation, you know, going back to my career, there's you know, two things. That, sorry, just to interrupt. Mm -hmm. um, there is that, but also being able to just like having the uh, the strength and like thick skin to deal with it because if the internet comes after you it can be particularly brutal like it's not a fun experience sure yeah you know being shouted at and criticized uh -huh. personally continually sure you know but at the same time you can build resilience to that you can yeah and so it's just you know i, I buy the idea that if it's a celebration of not being able to be you know uh, cancelled from yeah, yeah. disenfranchised, cancelled from a system. I buy that. I think that's great. I also think you can just then build the structures around you where you don't have to really give a shit about people being sure. And that this is why I think the argument for or against toxic maximalism is a bit of a misnomer. So I think like you know it's going to continue to exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's going to continue to serve a useful function because to the extent that it can keep people with platforms honest uh, and inspire those people to you know have a meaningful check to like what their their thought process is. Uh, so why I mean what's the problem? Um, and again, like it, if as long as you can divorce yourself from whatever people are saying, it doesn't really affect you. It's just them saying whatever the hell they want, and you ignoring it. You know, it's, funny, uh, it's just funny that this argument comes from people. Like again, like, I, don't, I don't mean to include you here, but you know, uh, in in positions where they have benefited from that engagement. Like I was on the Pomp podcast recently, and he was again taking, you know, it doesn't like toxic maximalism. It's like, okay, well, you're you're a VC. <laughs> Why do you only invest in Bitcoin then? <laughs> like, if it's not because it's better for your metrics, better for your engagement, uh, sure, you may believe in it. Okay, you know, I'm just saying, toxic Bitcoin maximalism seems to be an effective tool by which the pleb Bitcoiners can hold people in position of power accountable for what they're saying, what they're doing. That's a fair, it's a fair point. And like I said, I have wrestled with it. I've wrestled mm. with it because I've been at the end of it sometimes. Yeah, sure. And it's been particularly brutal. But but I've never thought of it about it the other way. I've never thought, actually, how have I benefited from it? But like I, you probably I have. have and and I think again, it's people people forget. Not everyone has a platform. Yeah, the plebs don't necessarily have a platform. You know, the average guy with three hundred followers. You know, maybe he doesn't get listened to. Toxicity is a way for people to empower themselves within the Bitcoin network. So what about? What about with regards to uh, the attacks upon other cryptocurrencies? Well, I think platforms? again, I would I would draw a line between toxicity and like legal harassment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I think there's like a you can rely on old legal definitions to like oh is somebody actually like you know and by the way when I'm saying toxic maximalism I mean nobody should threaten you or you know no one should resort to to accusations of violence. I mean like that's not what I consider toxic okay, maximalism. Let's forget yeah, yeah but because that that doesn't happen. Right, you know, like, and there's a legal system that covers all that. Yeah, but like anonymous people coming on Twitter and threatening to attack your children or like smash your right. face. Right. So how, okay, how, yeah, how I mean, that, and that that to me is general harassment. It has yeah. nothing to do with Bitcoin. Like, you know, to me, Bitcoin toxicity has to have some. You know, if somebody's yelling at you and calling you an a hole because they don't like what you're saying about Bitcoin, I mean, it's still related. You know. Yeah, but but what about versus other cryptocurrencies? Are we wasting our time? Is it a good thing? Is does it does it serve any benefit? 
I mean, it doesn't serve a benefit in terms of, I think, uh, it's become really easy to shut out because I don't think that our arguments have expanded enough, right? So I go back to like my framework for how can you judge other cryptocurrencies? Like a lot of these things, they become really easy to dismiss. The fact that Bitcoin has the best economics, okay, sure, well, then there are gonna be shittier ones. Uh, the fact that it had a fairer launch, okay, well, maybe these don't need that, right? I think it really goes back to being like the user rights argument. If these are going to be financial systems that we build that are useful in perpetuity, then we want to build them in such a way where you have the strongest guarantees. And I think it, so I think it, we should continue to be suspicious and ask meaningful questions about the cryptocurrency community. I don't know if that always has to be toxicity, right? I think some of these ideas are objectively bad. We, sh we know that they are bad now. <laughs> and uh, I think those ideas should be discredited. A great example would be Shiba Inu. Like cryptocurrencies do not gain value from network effect and that coin will go up down as fast as it went up. There's nothing new that that coin is providing the ecosystem. There's no knowledge to be gained about it. But I ju that's the thing. I just completely don't think, I just yeah. don't think a lot of people care. I just don't. I just think they are, they might not. They are trying to fast track to make as much money as, sure. as possible, and they post rationalize their arguments. But when they look back in ten years, they sell their Shiba Shiba Inu. They spend the next five years, you know, on the coast of Greece, and then they come back to a world in which Shiba Inu is worthless and Bitcoin's still around. What's your reaction going to be? You're going to be like, oh, maybe that asshole was right. <laughs> but maybe, they, maybe they think thought they were right at the time. Like, look, sure, I'm a great investor. Yeah. You know, whatever. I mean, right. maybe people don't care about sound money. I, well, again, I think it's to me. It has to go back to the sound money argument needs to be replaced by a financial rights argument. It needs to be supplanted by something that isn't as easy to, to dismiss. And this was my problem with I, I think you uh, had uh, the people who wrote that paper, the only the strong survive, like on this on the you Adam Farrington. Yeah, a really great paper uh, that I don't think you know was written in such a way that it would really mean anything to anybody. You know, mm -hmm. like again, the fact that a lot of these cryptocurrencies are running on AWS. So what? If I can get more U.S. dollars for it, that's what the game is. So I think, to me, it's like we have to elevate our arguments. I think we have to. I think Gladstein and Jimmy Song have been great about Bitcoin is more ethical than the fiat system. But I don't know if anybody's really spent a lot of time to apply it to the to the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And I think, to me, that's what I've been trying to do with the recent columns I've been writing. Is okay, is Bitcoin more ethical than the cryptocurrency system? And I think the answer is yes, because because, because it has rights. a stronger guarantee. You have a stronger guarantee to your rights within the Bitcoin system. There is literally almost nothing anyone can do to you to take away your access to your private keys and the utility of those keys within the network. You alone as an individual have the ability to opt in or out of anything within the Bitcoin economy. That is categorically not true of the cryptocurrency economy. You are always at the behest of some other group uh, or you know collection of people who may want to exercise what they want over you. I don't think I'm not sure that argument will work. Like it, it works for the sound money people. I just think that these people who I are think it'll matter a lot when your NFT that you bought for seven million dollars all of a sudden doesn't have any value because that thing forked, whatever, shut down, whatever. Yeah, no, they have to go through that painful experience <laughs> and go, "Huh, I got fucked." Okay, like I did it. 2018, all my all my fucking shit coins went to you know crap. I the podcast went Bitcoin only. I went Bitcoin but let's only. Let's just let's just strip it down. All cryptocurrencies are capable of being changed. The question is. What is the process by which they are being changed? Yeah. This is, to me, the great unexplored current mystery of what is going on. Yeah. I don't even know that most Bitcoiners can tell you how Bitcoin changes. Bitcoin is going to be changed this November. Yep. There's going to be a, a upgrade <laughs> to the Bitcoin protocol, the most substantive in four years. I don't know if many people really understand how that occurred, why that occurred, and how that is different than what happens in the other systems. And I think, to me, that is one of the more meaningful distinctions. Yeah, no, but I, the point I'm coming back to is, like, I think you have to be really far down the rabbit hole to be start caring about this stuff. I don't think you have to be far down the rabbit holes for you to say, or, in sorry. Bitcoin, you have the right to your money in perpetuity forever, and I can't guarantee that to you in any of the other cryptocurrencies. Okay, so we, get, we have a bunch <laughs> of Solana guys out here, and we explain that to them. Do you think they get, they're going, huh, I'm up 200x, I don't give a fuck. Sure, but you might, someone somewhere might... Uh, take that from you. Well, so I like Dan Hill's argument. He said, well, you might just want to put a bit of that in Bitcoin. And this is why. Sure. I just think you sometimes have to go through the painful experience and then afterwards you're like, okay, I got, I got rug pulled here. I got fucked. Well, okay. well I get, I think, again, I think it's, it's not, I don't think that the cryptocurrency ecosystem is going to fail on a small scale. Mm -hmm. My big worry is that when it does fail, the cryptocurrency, the U.S. dollar 
crypto asset ecosystem, let's just call it that, when it does fail, it's going to fail on a level that is very large. Example, communism didn't work. A lot of people thought it was a great idea, it seemed all right. Needed to be tried on a massive scale, adopted by you know probably upwards of 10 to 20 countries, and there was a massive erosion of human rights and mass deaths resulted from the political experiment that was communism. Okay, that's an example. I think that with the cryptocurrency ecosystem, what is it? It's an economic and political revolution. Bitcoin is an economic and political revolution. Cryptocurrencies are an economic and political revolution, and they're very different. And I think my worry is that the cryptocurrency ecosystem, it's not going to fail on a small scale. Everybody's going to make U.S. dollars while the U.S. dollars are good. Everybody can think their project is great while the U.S. dollars are good. Like, what happens when that that ecosystem get large, gets larger? It gets more entrenched. There are more people on it. More value is in it. I think that's where I start to worry. It's not, I don't, I don't, <laughs> this is why I think the, the hyper-Bitcoinization tomorrow <laughs> gimmick is so strange. It's like, I don't, you really, really, you think that's going to happen? Everyone's going to lay their guns down and, you know. No, I think it's messy. It's going to, yeah, it's going to be awful. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and I think the cryptocurrency system, again, the worry here is fundamentally we've seen that it, how it behaves and it seems (laughs) co-optable. So I think like that's, those are the questions that I'm starting to ask because I think hyper Bitcoinization seems to be the inevitable future, but there are going to be stages and there's, there's, it's not going to be like just everybody over to Bitcoin. I don't. So, so how do you? How do you judge the cryptocurrency ecosystem? Do you just think it's like an ugly mess, or do you think it, this, these are valid experiments? I th- yeah. So I think that going back to the prior position, I think there was a period where I would have said that like there was a value to those experimentations, and I think that that's probably there was probably a period of time where that was true. Because Bitcoin was still being experimented on. I don't mm-hmm. think we really, so my thesis really for Bitcoin is that I don't think we really understood Bitcoin completely until like the end of 2017. I don't think it was possible to understand how Bitcoin was meaningfully different from the other cryptocurrency systems. At that point, they all seemed to be different systems in which political actors were jockeying to change them in some way. To me, the significant delineation was when Bitcoin rejected the political actors and it did not change and then continued to prosper. To me, that was the significant change. I think there's a lot of naivete, right? You can look at the whole 2010s cryptocurrency movement and you can kind of collapse it into a couple things. It was an experiment to see if you could make changes to some of Bitcoin's properties and those changes would result in the creation of new assets, quote unquote. Is that a real actuality that we live in? I don't know. I don't know if we have enough data there. I think there was, you know, look, Bitcoin was an invention. We've never, we never had what Bitcoin was before then. Now we live in a world of Bitcoin. I think the natural human response was to try any and all version that failed. But after 10 years, I mean, we have to admit that it's looking pretty good for Bitcoin right now. <laughs> you know, it's looking looking pretty nice. Like, you know, it's not looking like any of the weird things us of human beings have done to any of these other coins is really working out. Um, so we have to, like, at least look at it in this, at this point and say, okay, I think the, the likelihood that Bitcoin got everything right, especially as we understand these other uh, cryptocurrency ecosystems, starting to look pretty good, you know? But these cryptocurrencies still exist. <clears throat> they do, yeah. And like Ethereum has uh, managed to survive through to a second cycle and, you know, is mm-hmm. could survive to a third cycle. It's like, I think it will highly likely continue, yeah. Yeah, it's like what, at what point, do they, what point do they fail? Like so, so because like, I think they're all monies. The the question is to, to what they're, and I think they're all economies. The question here, I think, is what is the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum, really? Like, and I think that they are both competing economies. I think you have to then look at how they operate. In Bitcoin, you have an absolute guarantee to your money, and you know with almost absolute guarantee that that will never be revoked from you. In the cryptocurrency community, like the other cryptocurrencies at large. You just don't have that guarantee. And I think that's, to me, I think when you start to see that system fail, it will it will start to fail because of those kind of things. Right. But they're going to be large and systemic. They're not going to be like, oh, I lost money on my cream coin. That it's guy's just going to go right back and buy another coin. <laughs> it's going to be more fundamental collapse of the protocol. Well, again, like if you look at, um, you know, and I think we can look at systems, right? So if if it is true that Bitcoin is not beholden to majoritarianism, right? Mm-hmm. We live in a world where democracy is is viewed as the best political system for ensuring human rights. I think what becomes interesting is 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 Bitcoin better at ensuring human rights than a, de- a democratic system? 
Because I think a lot of the cryptocurrencies, what they do mm -hmm. is they they map over the democratic system to their operational principles. And they say, okay, we agree, if you form a majority and your majority wants to enforce something, then that is what is. So I think it's really important actually when you delineate Bitcoin, not really just as an economic creation, but as a political creation, like it, the ability for you to say you cannot be disenfranchised within Bitcoin, you can actually, you can't be kicked out of that system by any political actor is a strong differentiator, not from just our existing fiat system as a money, but the political system that manages the fiat money. They're intertwined, they're the same thing. There is no fiat without the political system that attached to it. Yep. So then you have to look, okay, what is the cryptocurrency as money? And then what is the political system that is attached to it? In Bitcoin, there is no political system. It's absolute. You can form uh, coalitions, and those coalitions can enact change, but they seem to so far be not be able to take away basic user rights. That's very powerful. If that continues, that is a game-changing differentiator, not just on the economic level, but also on the political level. Is, is that actually true? Because if there was a requirement for an emergency patch on Bitcoin, right. and this is the classic found, argument. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, I implicitly trust mm. the people who have access to the GitHub. Um, so, uh, so what I would, so this is the old argument that um, in an emergency, like, does, de like, uh, does democracy exist, right? Or, or like, yeah. or, um, and I think the thing is that what I would say to that, in a doomsday scenario, there is no minority. <laughs> like, here's a classic example, right? Uh, let's just say we all live on planet Earth, and tomorrow the Earth is going to be destroyed. Who's the political minority in that case? The people who want to stay on the planet Earth? Are they a meaningful political minority? Like, not really. I think the universal consensus in a doomsday scenario is to do the thing that is not, that doesn't result in absolute death, right? Uh, it becomes pretty cut and dry. So I think the way that I would look at that is like Bitcoin is not necessarily like technically, there's nothing like really technical about Bitcoin's protection of minority rights. It's yeah. entirely cultural. It's saying that we will not proceed with any change within our economy if it requires someone being forced to do something. And again, look at the cryptocurrency ecosystem that does not map out, <laughs> right? So if you, so that's why I think the way to look at the other cryptocurrencies is that they're competing with Bitcoin largely on time preference and political machinations. They're often those things are intertwined. Why do they have all these new features? Why are they moving so fast? Well, it's the political gears are like moving to allow those things. So if you're okay with, if you don't want the fiat system because all these things happen, well, why are you okay with them happening in the cryptocurrency world? Oh, because they're worth more fiat. Okay, great. <laughs> what was it? What was the tipping point for you going back to look through all this? What was the like the key things where you went, okay, I fucking get this now. What was the point where I got it? Yeah. Like what was the? Th there must have been like something. You're like, ah, oh, shit. Yes. Well, I so I I. I Become I, I become comfortable calling myself a Bitcoin maximalist again because I think if you look at the ways to judge a cryptocurrency against a, another cryptocurrency, I think Bitcoin is meaningfully better on each of those. The economics are better, the network's more decentralized, the launch was fair, and uh, the U as the user rights. I think you have absolute user rights within Bitcoin, right? Um, so I think for me, it's like that's when I got comfortable. It's I, I actually you know went and did the research and I came to the conclusion and I I feel like I wrestled with what I needed to wrestle with, which was you know look, I mean. Uh, I, I said in this tweet, like for the last column I wrote, I mean, I went to every other cryptocurrencies conference. I talked to all those people. Strength of argument, ultimately, right? But you sometimes you have to get there yourself, right? For me, I had to go. I had to get there myself. I think for some people, that's just going to be how it is, right? I don't know. Like I, I, I'm not someone who likes to be told what to do or what to think. And I think that's mm -hmm. why people reject Bitcoiners to some degree. Like, you know, Bit people feel like Bitcoiners are telling them what to think. That's th I, that's what I think when I people when people are angry about toxic maximalism, what I think they're really angry about is they're they're angry at being told how to think. And I think that tells us something really dangerous about what's going on in Bitcoin. Okay? We shouldn't be telling people how to think. We should be giving them the means to understand. Very big difference. Okay, separate the two. Because I've, I, I, I'm with you Telling on that. Telling you what to think. You don't want to just let me have that nice, well, like, that was a nice, No, like, I want you to, I want to it. We but, can end the podcast. <laughs> but because one of my things is that, that, that this will ex, this expands into asymmetric topics uh -huh. where we tell people what to think, which, mm. which are non-Bitcoin topics. And yeah, then sure, it, yeah. And then it can become a little bit culty. Like, oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. you're yeah. a carnivore, I'm a carnivore. You should guns, I should guns. <laughs> like, you're yeah. not vaccinated, I'm not vaccinated. Like, it, it, and it mm. creates this social pressure 
that you follow mm. us sometimes, like I, I believe sometimes people can follow what other people do because maybe because they're like, oh, I trust that person. If that person thinks that, that's maybe what I should be doing. Or maybe others, they feel like, shit, I, I want to be in the English. Well, that's why I also say that there are no Bitcoiners, right? If you consider me a Bitcoiner, Bitcoiner, great, I'm flattered. But I don't think that either your actions align with Bitcoin or they don't. Okay. And your actions might not align with Bitcoin. That might be fine. That what might... is aligning with Bitcoin? Aligning with consensus? And that's it? No, I think it. I think it's about okay. If you believe that Bitcoin is ultimately about providing financial freedoms to the world, yep. Then you sort of can view every action on the prism of does this advance Bitcoin? Is what you're doing actually meaningful advance of that? Or if not, could you be better? I think toxic maximalism exists to encourage people to be better. Okay. You went and bought a coffee, didn't use Bitcoin, didn't talk to the person about Bitcoin, didn't do anything for Bitcoin Network. You you probably weren't a Bitcoiner in that moment. That's fine. But you can always be better. You can always be better. That that's the point. I think is that we we should strive to be a Bitcoiner and to evangelize Bitcoin. We will ultimately fall short of that. But I think that you know I look back now and I say, man, those like hotel clerks that I could I just told that I was at a Bitcoin conference in Dubai or wherever the wherever the fuck Bitcoin could have changed their whole fucking life. I think about that. I didn't. I don't. I still don't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because I um, I've wrestled with this idea recently of like wanting to cast a wider net and talk about wider subjects. And I talked to Willie Wu about this. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, this is the thing. Willie's just like, here's the chart, and it's yeah, going up, like, and in, then in your buy my newsletter. <laughs> and sometimes I veer off, and I like really enjoy the chat, and I feel like oh, I missed something here. And then I come back yeah. and I have a conversation with you and the ones I just had. And I'm like, no, I've got to do this. You uh -huh. know, um, like, how do you relay that message? But I th I like the idea of helping people understand rather than telling them but but can you be a, can you be toxic while helping people understand or, or when you're being toxic you kind of have to tell people i think it depends on the context right okay. i think toxicity is appropriate against people who have platforms that could be used more effectively right if you really believe the bitcoin is aligned with human rights and the advancements of humanity steve hankey then you're right you can be toxic to that guy yeah he has a platform he is in a position to enact change. Are you? In, I think toxic maximalism is appropriate in situations where it is against some group that is capable of enacting change. A16Z, great example. Are they capable of enacting change? They sure shit are. Well, Worldcoin. Yep. Well, there you go. What the fuck did you make of that? It's like for me, this this was. This, I think this, this, this is, is Silicon Valley is part of the problem. Yes. They benefit from the loose money environments. They're not going to give that up. They have no incentive to understand Bitcoin. For and they me, will they will go down fighting just like Wall Street will go down fighting just like the government will go down fighting they will all they will all fight this till the end they would rather scan your eyeball <laughs> I think it's the worst <laughs> cryptocurrency <laughs> ever uh, probably invented is. there In was also robot sex nickels which I do like to name check some fun times because it's really funny no, but but if you look at the list of investors you got those no reaction on robot sex nickels sorry hope but it's still around you, you got Coinbase in there I'm like Coin, what, uh, what Coinbase for investing in Worldcoin okay. You've got those fucking idiots at Multicoin who believe they're geniuses, but really all they're doing is they're... Well, again, this is why I think it becomes the people who are in a position to know better, you have to take more of a role in speaking out against those people. I, right? think... I used to look up to Brian Armstrong of Coinbase. I, I thought that he built a great, credible business in the early days of Bitcoin. I thought that, that mattered. Today, I look at what Brian Armstrong is doing and I, I say... This is going to look so horrible in 30 years. Mm. I, I can't believe that you are still on that train. There's one thing, good thing he did recently where he said, we're not going to be a political business. If you want to be part of that, here's your severance package. You can go elsewhere. I, like That was like one of those moments like, huh? Brian did that? Fucking great. But, but going back to WorldCoin, you've got all these people. Like I think what Multicoin Capital is doing is fundamentally wrong. They are mm -hmm. spinning up investments in new platforms, getting in early, turning millions into billions and thinking they're geniuses. And I just think it's I think it's fundamentally a broken system. And I think they think they're geniuses. And perhaps uh -huh. they are. Perhaps I'm the moron. But they're like I feel like they're creating huge winners out of lots of losers. What we're doing is not Bitcoin. Because what we're doing is not Bitcoin, we can take liberties with user rights up to and including scanning their entire personal <laughs> uh, human existence. Uh, and then three, oh, the US dollar valuation justifies this action. This is that, I think when you look at the deep systemic flaws, flaws in cryptocurrency, it will be because they have intertwined the cryptocurrency market with what they're doing. The cryptocurrency market is not, whatever is happening here, 
the cryptocurrency market is one of the great evils. I think it'll be yeah. looked at, it'll be looked at with a, a lot of suspicion and hindsight. But we're so blind to it. I mean, you, every day you just go on a coin market cap. Yeah, but 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 I think Wellcoin. There's like an instant reaction of like, what the fuck? So yeah, they just don't care. Like, sh- don't. Shit, in, shit investors <laughs> scanning your iris. Somebody, there's people trying to justify that because you know. No, I think they really idea. think if Sam Altman was here, what he would tell you is that we're competing with Bitcoin by providing a fair launch to humanity, and because of the launch is one of the mechanisms that which we grade cryptocurrencies. This is why we need to go into third world countries and scan people's bodies and give them cryptocurrency and create a. a MLM structure like one coin where well again I think like it's, it's it's a testament to like human beings are great at trying like you can kind of look at it as like you know back to the theme of the initial conversation I think we're in this grand comedy of like human beings like trying and failing to understand Bitcoin and we're if you think Worldcoin is bad like in four years there's gonna be something worse of course they're gonna continue to do oh, this. sure they're probably gonna be a country world coin where they scan every you know every five seconds you know I don't know CBDCs. They're coming. They're coming. Yeah. I mean, I look, I think that the the future for Bitcoiners, I just want to try to, I think we just, we're so good at like kind of painting this, the confidence merchants are out. Hyper Bitcoinization is here, two or three months, blah, blah, blah. Maybe, maybe not. Can you live with it not? I can live with it not being. I can live with Bitcoin being number five on CoinMarketCap. I can live with Bitcoin uh, being shit on by every government. I don't need hyper Bitcoinization tomorrow. No, I'm. I, we talked about it. I've done my first, tour of duty you, tour. you do four years of bitcoin uh-huh. you've completed your first tour of duty uh-huh. it then gets easier so whether it's number five or number one i mean i think number one's important but if it loses it am i fine that's, well that's do, exactly why i that's the first thing i would attack do i have my rights do i have access to my bitcoin is it appreciating value do i feel protected it still does what i need it to do i can still uh-huh. live on a bitcoin standard it would be a, a sad signal for it to lose that top spot but you know I think we need to be mentally prepared for it, and I, to the extent that I can use my platform to get people to think about that, I would rather put that scenario to them than a scenario where you know they're on the Cayman Islands tomorrow on a Bitcoin Citadel, because I don't think that that's a likely future. So, I mean, it's a great conversation. Like you, you're obviously thought about this a lot, and I know what the research you've done. We did an interview previously with yeah, the right. history of Satoshi, and sure. What. What change, what meaningful change would you like to see from Bitcoiners then? I don't think, I mean, I just, again, we, I, I'm just good? trying to do my part, right? I think the thing that I'm trying to work to address is that I think the, we will, the world will need to understand what, what happened in Bitcoin. And I think we owe it to them to give them some reasonable explanation of what occurred. Again, I, and I don't know if we can do that now. I, don't, I think there's a lot of, you can spend a lot of time trying to argue with somebody, but I don't think we understand enough about what we've achieved, like what we've thought through, the things that we haven't, that, that we failed on. That's the stuff that I am working to document because I think, again, when I think about what does hyper-Bitcoinization mean and the world being thrust onto like a new system, it's going to mean a lot of people are gonna have a lot of questions about that kind of new system okay. and they're going to be in a position where they may be distrustful of Bitcoin. So and I think we owe it to think about those people. So you're soul, soul searching for this, you know, Huge shift that's going to come in society at some point in the future uh-huh. that is going to have positives, but a lot of negatives. Maybe that's going to lead to, yeah, you know, like what's s- happening in El Salvador. Yeah, that's going to happen on a global scale. If if hyper Bitcoinization really occurred, oh, you had social security. Oh, you were going to retire next year. Oh, that person's going to be real happy about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they need to understand why <laughs> you need to be like, hey, care. yeah, you know, you need to like work on this Bitcoin standard now. So like, yeah, you don't have benefits from the government anymore. Why would you, you know, it's, it's going to be a really unpleasant scenario for people. These people have, we've, and I, and when we were talking about the fun price speculation and stuff earlier, like we are all, we were born into the fiat system. We are all creatures of the fiat system on some level. Okay. C- c- have you thought about whether the, n- the net result could be worse. And some people will listen like, shut the fuck up, Pete. Of course it's better. I'm just saying sometimes you need to think these through. Could we end up in a net worse position? Because of Bitcoin? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. It would be because every human invention inevitably kind of crests on this. Like, democracy was great, and now we all kind of don't like democracy anymore. Okay. There's every human movement exists to just move the human race forward. There will be some period in the future where Bitcoin is a maligned movement that has failed because that is the nature of every movement that advances humanity. Bitcoin will reach some point with that. But the question is, is it good now? Is it better than what we're at now? Does it advance us? Well, okay, define advance. Like, take us to the next stage 
or make it a better society? I think that's kind of up to humanity, right? Like if you look at how humanity has generally progressed by moving through shifts in thought. There was the Renaissance, there was the Enlightenment, there was the Dark Ages, right? And now we live in fiat land, right? The product of democracies was, the, was that democracies emerged and the political uh, organizations within those societies, uh, they took a controlling stake in the economics of those countries. Bitcoin is the reaction to that. Bitcoin will fix that problem if and implemented a on a large problem. scale. Yeah. It, but it, it can only advance so far. In the same way democracy could only advance so far. Someone will will try something and something will happen. You just, you know, it's the old uh, live long enough to become the villain. The founding fathers created democracy. It was a great human invention and it has advanced us. It, it for 200 years was the best way for us to enshrine our rights and values. I don't think there are many people who are in Bitcoin who still believe that democracy serves that function. That does not mean that democracy was not a valuable human creation. It was. We've moved past it. We need something new. It's Bitcoin. Something else will follow that. That's the nature of human progress. So lots to think about there. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for giving me that pause there. It felt that was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Good pause there. Got to end a podcast on a nice pause. Yeah, yeah. I, there's a lot to contemplate because it's a whole show in itself. It's like, okay, mm. what are the consequences? And I, I believe I haven't listened yet. I believe that's the show Valis and Preston Pish made. Well, I think Drew Bonsall has written a lot. Probably the only real science fiction about Bitcoin. Did you, <laughs> did you hear the show I made with him about that? Uh, I don't think I listened to that, but I've read. You've read it. I've read all of it. Yeah, a couple times. It's wild man. Amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, but that to me, that's sort of you know. At least someone's thinking about it. Yeah. He's thinking <laughs> hundreds of years ahead. I mean, yeah. Uh, I love Bitcoin. I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin astronomy. It's probably one of my favorite pieces of Bitcoin writing. I think the only real Bitcoin science fiction that's been written. Yeah. I know somebody's working on something else. Which oh, I'm really? Forward to. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, what are you working on next? What's the next big topic for you? <sighs> yeah. I'm still writing the next Bitcoin history piece that I've been writing on for a little okay. while. Uh, that Can you talk about the period you're covering? Yeah, just the origins of Bitcoin toxicity and Bitcoin maximalism. So nice. Yeah. So are you awarding it to a Bitcoiner or to Vitalik? Oh, and no, Vitalik is not a. Well, I guess he would be in the story. Yeah, I think he's 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 not part of the story, but yeah. When can we expect it? After the bull market, you know, you gotta you gotta get your <laughs> you gotta get uh, you know uh, you gotta work while the what is it make hay while the sun shines, right? Yeah, man. You know, so I'm uh, I'm hoping in the top of next year, but uh, I, I, you know, I'm a big believer in the Bitcoin cycles. I think we're coming to the end of this cycle. Looking forward to taking a little bit of a break. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to become someone who could contribute something valuable to Bitcoin. You have, and you are, especially now. Look, you don't know how you like taking compliments, but I think uh, everything you've done. As long as you don't call me Peter at the beginning of the. Rizzo. <laughs> I think everything you've done since I thought uh, what you did at Cointest was great. Uh, I still think it was valuable uh, for Bitcoin, uh, and I understand how you reflect on it, and I, I can agree with that at the same time. But I think everything you've done since uh, Coindesk, the soul search in the place you've come to, and the, the you're taking quite a unique position that you're challenging a lot of assumptions. And um, I think in some ways, take this in the right way, in some ways you're a little bit like Udi. But mm. you're not trolling people. Mm. You're, you're like Udi without the trolling. Okay, mm. that's a good. Like, that's a small niche. <laughs> well, but it's like you know, you're you're you're. It's like it's checking a balance. You make people right, think. Yeah. I've re like I'm thinking during this, and like uh -huh. I'm having pauses. I'm almost wishing I was keeping notes. It's like uh -huh. okay, I need to go and rethink that. Uh -huh. I'm really like at the moment. I'm really worrying about or thinking about the implications of Bitcoin on society. Uh -huh. The net good, the net bad. Whether right. what what happens and it just I see positive I see negative and I'm having that's, a yeah question that's everything you know I mean there, why should we expect anything else I mean we shouldn't thrust any greater expectation on the Bitcoin right is Bitcoin currently a tool for human advancement emphatically yes yeah but what does that mean and what is the transition but I don't think it's hyper Bitcoinization tomorrow no I do want to make a bumper sticker that just says like hyper Bitcoinization tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> you should do it man. <laughs> Yeah. All right, Rizzo, tell people where to find you. On Twitter, at Pete underscore Rizzo underscore. Um, you can find me, uh, editor of Bitcoin Magazine, so publishing stuff over there, do a column for Forbes, uh, and also run the open source charitable grants for Kraken Cryptocurrency Exchange. So if you're working on a great Bitcoin project uh, that needs some funding, uh, let me know. All right, man. 
Well, let's enjoy the rest of the ball run. Let's make hay, and I'm sure we'll do something sure. early next year. All right, bud. Thanks, man. Podcast over.